Good morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday. It is July 2nd, and we are in the midst of summer. I've really only been out of school for a couple weeks, but I'm trying to really slow down and enjoy every second summer has to offer because I feel like once August comes around, even though I don't go to school until our school doesn't start until the end of August, I feel like once I hear August, it means to me that summer is like over, which is a little doomsday y. Um, but that's the realistic, uh, that's the real thing going on in my brain. So all of July, I'm going to try to really kind of slow it down, enjoy, get some stuff done for work, and also just have fun with the kids, which I feel like I've been having a pretty decent uh, balance towards. But let's talk about today's video. I'm heading into my office, I have my coffee, and today I wanted to share with you five easy tips to kind of level up your literacy this coming year. Now, this is based off a webinar I did last summer, actually. Um, I made a few tweaks and a couple different changes based on what I had done this past year in school. So this video is going to already assume that you have a little understanding of what structured literacy already is, the components of a structured literacy lesson, and then in today's video, I'm just gonna share some techniques and activities that you can use to kind of level up that literacy instruction and make sure you're progressing uh, not just yourself but also your students towards becoming competent readers so if you are ready for this video give it a thumbs up make sure you are subscribed to my channel and let's dive in all right let's just dive right in literacy activity number one to level up your instruction is going to be to incorporate the three-part drill now, this is an Orton Gillingham drill that I learned in my MZ training years ago. And it was one of those things that when I learned about it, I really had that kind of light bulb moment because learning about its effectiveness and its ease of use in the classroom just made it make so much sense. And I knew I could incorporate it into my own classroom regardless of what curriculum I was currently using. And that's exactly what I did last year. So if you followed me in the classroom last year, I used foundations, that is what our district is using. And while I like foundations a lot, it has many great elements to it. Um, I didn't really love the review and the spiral that it had at the beginning of each lesson. It does have some of the similar components about a visual, auditory, and blending drill, but not in a structured and coherent, cohesive way, or not as coherent and cohesive as I would have liked. So what I did is I incorporated the three-part drill two to three times a week in my own classroom. Now, if you don't know what the three-part drill is, I'm just going to explain it really quickly and give you some examples and ways you can use it in your classroom. Now, like mentioned in the name, there are three parts to the three-part drill. The first is the visual part, then is the auditory, and then we go into blending. So let's walk through each one real quick. Now, the three-part drill is a great way to review previously taught skills and really build that automaticity with sounds and blending. So this is going to be a great practice opportunity for your students to not only see letters and recognize the sound immediately, but they're also going to be able to hear letter sounds and recognize what letter makes that sound. And also they're going to build that automaticity and that fluency when it comes to blending sounds together to read words. So all three of those things you know are beneficial and needed for students to read. So again, the three-part drill is just a great easy way to get your students practicing those skills. So the first part of the drill is the visual part. And here the teacher is just going to hold up a letter or group of letters. And it's important to note that the three part drill is always review. So it is always going to be sounds and letters and skills students have already been taught explicitly. So here the teacher is holding up an F, the teacher would just hold it up and the student says the sound then you keep going with different letters. So this is a great time. You wanna do about 20 letters or so that you'll show, whether it's digraphs, whether it's vowel teams, again, any skill that your students have already learned, but you do want to throw in some ones that your students already know, and you wanna throw in some ones that your students might be struggling with a little bit. So let's pretend you taught the digraphs last week and your students are still struggling on them. The three-part drill is a great time to again, build that automaticity, get them used to seeing the graphemes, knowing the phoneme, seeing the grapheme, knowing the phoneme. So that visual part is quick. You can do that with some flashcards. You could do it on a slide where you just have letters pop up, totally up to you. And you can also kind of scaffold that as needed. 
In foundations, a lot of the letter cards will actually have an image on it. So what I do is towards the beginning of the year, I keep that keyword or that key image up there so students have that. And then as the year progresses, I take it away. The goal with the scaffold is always to provide it and then take it away um, so students don't need to rely on it anymore. So that's something that I will do. And then in small group, if they still need that image, we can do that. Okay, so that's the visual part. The next part of the three-part drill is going to be the auditory part. Now for this part of the drill, the teacher doesn't need Need anything um, here this is where students are going to listen to the sound and they have to spell the way that sound is made now the eyes on me is also going to allow for some scaffolding as needed I did have quite a few students last year who were still pretty confused when they would hear the sound the F and the TH and so our sign for TH thumb was this so if I was doing I would have them look at my tongue and then it would also kind of give them this little symbol as needed so they knew that they were writing th again kind of take those scaffolds away sometimes i would take that thumb away and have them really looking at my mouth and i would say look at where my tongue is placed giving them all those visual cues so they know what sound they're hearing and then how to write it. Now for this part of the drill, this is where a lot of multi-sensory, you know, kind of fun activities can come in, but just note that they don't need to. So what I mean by that is sometimes I will see lots of like shaving cream, for example, people will use shaving cream, that's a ton of fun, but that also requires a lot of prep, a lot of cleanup, and potentially a lot of wasted instructional time. Um, I did have little bins of sand that we would use every Friday, but most often the thing that we would use are these little plastic screens right here now sometimes we would just use the screen and students would form the letter on the screen just so they have that tactile input um, other times i would take that screen and i would put it under a blank piece of paper and students would actually write the letter with a crayon on their paper this way as i would walk around too i could see the letter that they were making um, and then as they finished it they could trace the bumps over and over again so just for example this is what this part of the drill would look like all right, everybody has their bumpy boards. Okay, eyes on me, spell ah. And I would look around, students might be, you could have them sky write it, you could have a paintbrush in their hand and they can draw it with a paintbrush. Really, they are just, again, forming that letter. It's to get that automaticity. I hear ah, I know it's a. Now, since we're spelling sounds here, we often know that there are numerous ways to make different sounds. So as we learn more, I teach my students to make all the different ways they can make that sound. So for example, I would say, all right, spell the three different ways we know to make k. And I would be looking for students to make a C, for them to make a K, and for them to make CK, the digraph, once we've learned it. We do this too as we go on throughout the year, and let's say we've learned different ways to make long A. So I might say, eyes on me, spell all the ways you know to make A and they would do A I, A Y, they would just do one A, and they would do A with the silent E on the end. So that was towards the end of the year, they knew how to make all four of those. So that's the auditory part. So first we have the visual, we flash the letters, and students say the sound quickly. Then we go into the auditory where they listen for the sound and they show you how to form it quickly. And then last we go into that blending. Again, another reason I don't like to make a big to-do of the uh, multi-sensory portion of that auditory portion is because we still have another part of the drill that we have to get into so I don't want my students spending so much time uh, cleaning up shaving cream or putting all their tools away uh, we kind of do a quick transition and then I want everybody's eyes on the board because we're about to blend now for the blending drill this is really where we are taking that letter sound knowledge and we are putting it all together to make words and in fact I tell my students that at the beginning of every blending drill I say why do we learn our letters and sounds so we can read. All right, let's start reading. And for the blending drill, all you'll need to do is just have students blend sounds to make words. Sounds pretty simple, right? Again, you'll wanna make sure that all of these skills and concepts are things students have already learned previously and they are just practicing. Um, they're reviewing it and they're really trying to build up that automaticity. That is the name of the game for this drill. Here you can see the binder blending kit that I created a couple years ago. Um, this I really used in small groups, but I would often actually just have up on the board a different blending drill each day so we could all do it together. Uh, and then the one with the binder I would use in small groups back at the table if they needed more help with it during like a small group lesson type thing. Realistically, most of the time I did a blending drill on the board with my students because I like to use continuous blending where my students are seeing one sound at a time instead of seeing all of the letters together. So here's just a quick example with some blending sides I already have. I would just show up the sound. I would say sound, b, sound, r, blend, b, 
bar sound k word bark. And they would blend it together. So in the middle slide there, I am having them blend b and r together to make bar k. So we can just add it on to the end. And I would do about 15 to 20 of those as well. So just to reiterate, in the three-part drill, you are doing it about two to three times per week. You're doing about 20 letters for the visual part, about 20 or so sounds for the auditory part, and then again, you're kind of blending about 20 words together. Not only is this a great way to review all these different skills you're learning, build that automaticity, but it's also a wonderful way to scaffold and differentiate for your class as needed. Many phonics curriculums out there kind of assume that we are, you know, all your students are on the same level. So as we just progress through these skills quickly and many of your students may not have mastered uh, you know silent E in the week or two weeks that you taught it so this is a great time to kind of bring that back to review it to practice it and build up that automaticity while you're still accessing great level content so that is tip one use the three-part drill all right moving into activity number two for leveling up your literacy and that is to incorporate some concept attainment lessons into your phonics instruction now if you've been following my channel for the last few years i have mentioned this strategy numerous times it is such a fun one and an engaging one for students that's why i continue to bring it up but it's another fun one to kind of sprinkle into your literacy instruction and level it up a little bit so we know when we're teaching a new skill we really want to start with that sound and how important phonemic awareness is well, using these concept attainment slides is one of my favorite ways to do that. Now, here's one that I might use at the very beginning of the year in first grade or in kindergarten. And basically with concept attainment, I explained to my students that we're playing a game called what's the rule and everything on the thumbs up side has to apply to the rule for it to be the rule and also for it to be the rule it can't apply to anything on the thumbs downside so here i would say okay listen to each of these words what do you think the rule might be we have mouse mix map mop mud for example and then i would say okay let's listen to the other side we have pen web bug hat and so we try to hear what's the same about everything on that thumbs up side and hopefully they would start to hear that wait a sec everything on that thumbs up side had mmm starts with that mmm sound and some of your students might know that's the letter m and then once students start to hypothesize and come up with what they think the rule is we can check it and again the way we check it is to make sure it applies to everything on the thumbs up side and nothing on the thumbs down side. Now you could definitely throw up the slide just like that one is where all the images are already out there, but you could also do it one by one like this. So play along with me. Let's see if you understand the rule. All right, everybody, what is the rule? Here we have B, paint, seal, light, leaf, bow, seed, fly, and hopefully you could see there that the rule is all the ones on the thumbs up side have that long E sound. So that would be an introduction into that sound. I might then go into teaching about the different vowel patterns that can make that sound E, E and E, A and when we use each one. But it's really just a fun intro and what I like about doing it when we show it one by one is as I continue to show some, students are gonna raise their hand, they're gonna think that they know a rule and it, it lets you kind of say, okay, we think that's what the rule is. You might have a couple different ones and we continue to show thumbs up and thumbs down examples and we see if that rule still applies or which or if we can kind of take it away, narrow it down and figure out what it really is. But adding concept attainment is just a fun and entertaining way to get all your students involved and really get them thinking about that phonemic awareness. All right, activity number three to help level up your literacy instruction is to include more dictation and encoding practice. Now, it has long been a pattern in phonics instruction and with curriculums that decoding has heavily outweighed encoding practice. And in recent years, many curriculum companies and, you know, different teachers as they learn more are trying to kind of balance that out. Uh, we know how important encoding is to really strengthen that phoneme and grapheme relationship that students build inside their heads to help them orthographically map different words. So by only focusing on the decoding and not the encoding, we are doing our students a disservice. So my challenge to you this upcoming year is to make sure you are incorporating more dictation or encoding practice with your students. Now, I hope you noticed that in activity number one, the three-part drill, we have some of that encoding practice. So even just incorporating that drill two to three times a week in your classroom is going to help students tremendously. It really strengthens that phoneme grapheme relationship and it helps students just quickly remember the sound to the letter 
and how to form it. Another great way to do this is to incorporate phoneme grapheme mapping activities consistently in your classroom. Now here's an example. These are some of my themed phoneme grapheme mapping boards. Um, the theme kind of goes along with the blending slides. I shared earlier those blending slides. I think the word was bark and they were going through space, I think it was. So in the R controlled vowels phoneme grapheme mapping mats, the theme is like space. So they're kind of connected, but you don't need to use both of them. Anyways, here's a picture from my digraph version. Um, there's a picture of the word chick here, and basically I have a bunch of cards, and where that chick is is just a little blank square. So students could go ahead and flip a picture. They would say it out loud, chick. They would have to put a cube or some sort of manipulative into each of those boxes to represent how many sounds there are. Ch, i, k. There are three sounds. And then down on the lines, they go ahead and write the letters that make those sounds. So ch is ch, i is going to be i, and k, I would expect students to know, is ck. Then you can see that little ant on the side there with the popsicle stick. This is the last part of the drill that I have my students do. I have them take that ant and they actually run it underneath the word that they wrote, chick, 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 and they read it three times. Now those specific mats are something I used in small group all year long, and I would always start first by just dictating words and telling students the words I wanted them to spell so they would not use an image first. I would say shell, let's count it, sh, e, l, three sounds, so they would go ahead and put three cubes there, and then we would spell it. Sh is sh, e is going to be e, and l is that double l. And then I would have students write it and read it three times. As we continued that practice in my small group, I might go ahead and just dictate words to maybe one student or two students, depending on how they're doing, while I have other students take those cards and they can go ahead and flip them and practice it on their own while I can quickly kind of check over and see how they're doing. Now you wanna do an activity like this in whole group as well, but students don't necessarily need to have those mats in whole group. They can use something like a whiteboard and you can do the same exact type of practice. All right, everybody, we're going to spell the word chick. Let's say it, chick. Count the sounds, ch, i, k. And you can have students here just draw lines if they don't have whiteboards that already have boxes on them. They can go ahead and draw lines for how many sounds there are. So three lines, and then again, they spell it and read it. Here's a picture of something else I did often in small groups at the back table. These are my one page interventions and they were focused on specific skills. But what I liked about these is again, every time we did it, it included some sort of dictation. So here at the top, you can see the pattern students were reviewing is going to be TH. So we would start with some sounds. Here we have some L blends. We have a, a word family ick at the end here. Just sounds that I wanted my students to be able to quickly and accurately say. And then we go into words with those sounds in isolation. And then we go into sentences. And then at the bottom here, students need to go ahead and listen for two words that I say and write them down on the lines. And then there's also a picture box for students to pick one of those sentences that they read and they need to draw a picture of what's happening just to kind of show some comprehension there as well. Now I only put two lines there for some word dictation and I did that on purpose because again this was like an intervention group. So my plan was for these, what I do in my small groups is I usually have three or four students and when I give those two words for students to dictate, I'm of course, you know, keeping track and making sure who's able to do it, who might need a little reteaching here. Um, and what I would do is my students that needed reteaching, I would use a whiteboard and we would kind of follow that phoneme grapheme mapping activity uh, to help reteach these and fix any misconceptions with patterns that students might be struggling with. And as I was doing that with my students, I would give the other kids there who maybe spelled those words correctly right away, I would give them a sentence to go ahead and write. So I would dictate a sentence and I would have them practice that since they already wrote the words perfectly. Um, or I would tell them to write their own sentence with one of those words. So they would be doing some sentence writing while I could kind of focus in on one or two students that still needed help just doing that word in isolation. And last but not least, partner games and independent work is also another great time students can practice encoding as well as decoding. They don't need to always be practicing decoding, they can kind of do both. Here are some activities that I love to use in my classroom. The first one over here on the left is called Spin, Say, Spell. And again, these are skill-based. So here, the first one, it looks like students are working on that diphthong, ow. Um, with OU and OW, so this would definitely be end of the year first grade or beginning second grade, and they would just spin one of the pictures, 
crown and then they would have to go ahead and write it down on the lines next to them and they continue to do that until they have filled in all 10 spaces. In the middle we have say, tap, and write. This is going to give that little scaffold of tapping out the sounds and this is just a worksheet based activity where students have to say the word sheep, tap the sounds, sh, e, p, and then write them in the boxes. So it's a little more scaffolded since it already has the tapping circles and it has the spelling boxes for students. And then over on the right here, we have some encoding practice with a word sort. I love word sorts as a way for students to really dissect different words and different sounds they hear in words. So here, this was a final blend sort where we had st, st on one side and nt, nt on the other side. And what I like students to do is not only do they have to first look at the pictures and go ahead and sort them based on what they hear, but then they have that additional step where they can actually encode or try to spell each of those words. So they go ahead and write it above it. Vest, nest, paint, and tent. Adding in that spelling practice is a great way for students to really start to balance that encoding and decoding. Every time you send them off to do something for a literacy center or independent practice, it doesn't always need to be some sort of decoding practice. We can add in that spelling as well. All right, we are down to our last two tips to help level up your literacy instruction. Tip number four is going to be to be purposeful about your vocabulary instruction. Now, if you watched my video recently where I said things I wanna keep and things I wanna change for next year, one of the things I really wanted to change is to be more purposeful about my vocab instruction. And I said in that video that I have a solid understanding of how to teach students new vocabulary words and I, I have all the knowledge around it, but I didn't have the routine for it. So my goal this upcoming year is to really be purposeful in the routines that I have to make sure I'm introducing enough vocabulary words to help my students develop not only their depth of vocabulary, but also their breadth of vocabulary. So I wanna make sure that they are learning more words and understanding them at a deeper level. Now, I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about this tip. If you have a good knowledge building curriculum, hopefully that curriculum is already picking out words to help develop your students' breadth and depth of knowledge. That alone is going to be such a big help. Not having a full curriculum to kind of pick out those words for you doesn't mean you can't do it by any means. Um, it just means you need to be more purposeful about making sure you're choosing the right words and choosing enough words for your students to learn throughout the year. So usually I would do this through my read alouds. Again, if I don't have a curriculum, which I did not last year um, using something like my book bunches right here um, really helped me guide that's why I started creating them last year because it helped me guide that vocabulary as well as that comprehension and what I did is I essentially picked a bunch of popular read alouds that all had a good uh, theme or message or something to kind of build upon when reading it anyway and I picked out the tier two words and I gave examples for how to teach them. So that is something I plan to continue next year until we choose one of our uh, curriculums that we're piloting next year. That again, will hopefully take, take that heavy lift off the teacher. But if you were like me in a situation like me last year where you did not have a curriculum to pick out those words for you and help develop them with your students, just make sure that you are doing a better job than I did of picking out enough enough vocabulary because when I did teach vocabulary, I know I taught it great, but I don't think I picked enough words um, just reflecting on the past year. I really, you really wanna teach about 10 to 12 new words per week um, and I probably taught about five on average. So I really want to beef that up a little bit. Now, when we are explicitly teaching new vocabulary words, there are five main steps you will want to walk through with your students. So I'm just gonna quickly go through them with you using an example that I would use in my first grade classroom. So first and foremost, you are going to want to say the word aloud and point out any word parts that you might think are beneficial for your students. So I would say, all right, here the word is gather. Can you say it? gather. We would go ahead and clap it, gather. We have two syllables and I'm noticing a digraph in the middle. We have that th sound, v, v. Ooh, and that is our voiced one. And for this, I would point out that this is our voiced v, where we can feel our vocal cords moving when we say it. 
Then for step two, you're gonna wanna share a student-friendly definition, and this is definitely where I like to include some visuals. So I would tell my students that to gather means to bring together from different places, and I would explain that people can gather, but we can also gather things like physical and non-physical things. And I would kind of go through each of these pictures. I would say, here we have some people gathering around a table, here we have people gathering for a concert, here somebody has gathered up a bunch of teddy bears, and also I see these two boys gathering some information from computers. So they're getting things from different places and bringing it together. Then you'll wanna give some examples of you using the word in sentences. I can say, will everyone gather on the rug? Calvin gathered all the stuffed animals around the house. My family gathers at my house every Thanksgiving and we should gather the tools before we begin the project. And you might notice here that while using those words, I also added some suffixes here just so they can hear them, but understand that the base word still means the same thing. Step four is going to be to ask some yes or no questions or give yes or no examples. So I'd say, okay, give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Does this sound like gathering? Julia went outside and picked a lot of wildflowers. She put them together and tied the flowers with a ribbon. She handed them to her mother. And you would ask your students, does that sound like gathered? They might say yes, ask why. She went outside, she gathered wildflowers and she put them together. That's what gathered means. And then I'd say, okay, does this one sound like gathering? It was Saturday morning, my older brother left for practice, my mom took my little sister to art class, I played video games while my dad ate cereal at the counter. Does that sound like gathering? And they might say no, everybody was kind of spread about. Uh, doing their own thing. They, they didn't come together at any time. And just for a quick little note too, I teach vocabulary, if these are the words you're teaching, uh, day one, I would do steps one, two, and three, where I am saying the word aloud, pointing out those word parts, giving a student-friendly definition, and then using the word in a sentence. It would be on the next day that I would do steps four and steps five, just so you know. And then that last step, of course, is going to be to elicit word use by your students. So you will want to ask them to, hmm, let's think of a time you gathered with others. And then they can turn and talk and turn and tell your partner about a time you gathered with others, but be sure to use that word gather. So here's where you can actually, they can kind of play around with using that word. It might sound a little funky at first for them, so they have to really practice using it. Um, and this is just a fun way for you to hear them and clear up any misconceptions as needed. But those are the five steps for teaching explicit vocabulary in your class. All right, and last but not least, we have come to tip number five for leveling up your literacy this year, and that is going to be to increase student comprehension with purposeful pre and post reading activities. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about some of those pre reading activities you should do before you dive into a read aloud, as well as some post reading activities to really help your students with their comprehension. Now, I feel like as teachers, we're really good at the post reading activities, right? We know that we are doing a read aloud for a reason, so we we ask our students all the questions we want them to know. We uh, make sure that they understood what was happening in the story, but it's those pre-reading activities that we sometimes forget about. So let's take a look at some pre-reading activities we can use with our students. Pre-reading is just as important for the teacher as well as the student to make sure that we are really maximizing our instructional time. Now, before we actually read a student with our students, we want to establish the purpose. We want to make sure that students understand why we are reading this story, if there's a skill we want them to practice, or if there's something we want them to learn more about. By having that purpose in students' head, it gives them kind of a reason for listening in and tuning in more deeply to the story. We also want to provide or elicit any background knowledge that we feel our students might need to really access the story as well. This is also when we want to pre-teach any vocabulary, identify the genre and text structure, and we might want to ask some questions prior to reading, like making predictions, um, again, to just kind of get our students' brains ready. And then also this is the time before we read the story that the teacher really wants to take a moment plan out their stopping points with think alouds. Now I know as veteran teachers, because I feel this way too, I feel like I could easily just pick up a read aloud book and I would do a great job kind of knowing when I want my students to stop and really think about something, what words I want them to focus on. Um, and I do think that's true. I do think, especially with more time and practice and knowledge, we are definitely able to do that. Again, self-included, I feel like I could easily do that. But I also know that when I do take the time to think about it beforehand and plan it out beforehand, it is better. 
you know? I mean, there's kind of no way to deny that if I actually take that planning time beforehand to really look into the book, uh, think about exactly what my students need to know, what words uh, so-and-so might struggle with, or uh, what concepts my students just aren't gathering, um, it just, it really helps out with everything. So not only does that planning part come into play, but it is going to help with our students comprehension if we can take just a few minutes before to really read the book cover to cover and kind of even just throw a little sticky note on the page that um, just to remind yourself like this is what I want to ask for this question and make sure it aligns with the purpose that you set for the read aloud. So then we're ready to go ahead and read the book. We read the book with our students and often with a read aloud, you wanna read it at least two times. Now, if you're doing like a real knowledge building curriculum, you're gonna read it way more than two times, but long gone are the days where you can just like pick up a book every day and just say, okay, today we're gonna to focus on retelling. Here's this book. Today we're gonna to focus on characters. Here's this book and kind of reading all these fun texts. It is fun for students, it's entertaining for students, but what it's not doing is allowing students to have multiple reads of a story to really deepen their comprehension. Um, every time you reread a passage, reread a small book, you gain more information from it. So you do want to make sure you're reading a read aloud at least two times. So here are some post reading activities and they have a one and a two next to them. One is going to be what you want to do after the first reading of the text and two is what you might want to do during that second reading. So after you've read the book the first time, you wanna go ahead and discuss that purpose that you brought up beforehand. You wanna connect any pre-reading activities that you did, if they made predictions, did they come true? If you did a KWL chart, what did you learn? Um, and you'll wanna pair up and share any big takeaways from the story. And this is a good time to kind of show that text structure. So after they read a story once, students will probably be able to retell a little bit of what happened. They'll be able to talk about a main character change, um, they'll be able to do kind of those those big overarching concepts, but it's after the second read aloud that you can get a little deeper. This is where you want to ask students to answer some text dependent and deeper questions. You want to use vocabulary that you taught them and connect it to the text. And this is where you can really dive into some important uh, parts of the text. So not the entire story. Um, again, if we retold the whole thing or if we talked about how a character changed, this is where we can go in, okay, what are the exact parts of the story that helps that character change? Or, you know, that's just an example, but whatever the skill that you're working on is. And this is also a great time to have students do some independent application. So whether you're having them write down a retell because they told it yesterday to somebody else, today they can go retell uh, on their own or they can answer some questions on their own. But you wanna do that after a second or a third read aloud, not after the first one. And then just real quick, two other post-reading activities that I love to use, especially in the last year, are going to be ones that uh, kind of extend the learning and really get you thinking about uh, text structure and writing structure. So I have shared these before, but here we have the book Koala, The Koala Who Could by Rachel Bright. And what I like to do here is this is the because but so strategy. This is from the writing revolution. And just to clarify, we would only use because in kindergarten, we would probably use because and but in first grade, and we would use all three because but and so in second grade. And what we do here is I would just pick a sentence that kind of sums up the story. Kevin was a brave koala. And I would ask my students, do you agree? Do you disagree? They would probably all agree based on what happened in the story. And then I would ask them to go ahead and extend this sentence using each of these words, because, but, and so. So I would say Kevin was a brave koala because, and that would be a sentence stem that I would put up on the board. Now again, kindergarten, beginning of year in first grade, you might want to just answer these orally. Kevin was a brave koala because he took a chance and made new friends or you could listen to other people's and you can write them down. Then we would say, okay, Kevin was a brave koala, but at first he was fearful of change. And then Kevin was a brave koala, so he started to try new things. What's great about this is not only are students needing to understand what happened in the story and use examples from the story, but they're also expanding their sentences, right? Either orally or in written language, either is great. Um, and they're also understanding those words because, but, and so. So that's one sentence type activity I love to do, and here is the other one. 
Here we have another book by Rachel Bright. I love all of her stories. This is called The Squirrels Who Squabbled. And here's where I actually take a sentence, like a mentor sentence from the story itself. They'd squandered their chances to team up and share. And we talk about what the sentence actually means. What does squandered mean? How does it relate to the story? What happened? And then I just turn it into a sentence scramble. We know how great sentence scrambles are for students to understand syntax um, and talk about capitalization, punctuation, what all these little words mean. And this lets them actually take those words and we'll do it together to kind of put it back together. And then again, kind of discuss the mentor sentence. This was something I also did a lot last year, those book bunches that I mentioned earlier with the vocab. I also picked out a sentence for each of those as well as the um, and made like a sheet for the because but so and I did a sentence scramble for them too so that way students could actually try to rework it and again they have to use the knowledge from the text to be able to do that so instead of just a random sentence scramble or a random sentence expansion activity instead we are doing it with a book that we read. Phew. Okay, I know that was a lot, but I really wanted to take this time to share those five different activities because I think you can easily implement them into your classroom this upcoming year. Um, and if all five, if you're not doing any of them and all five of them seems like a lot and you're like, I, I just need to focus on one or two, let me know down in the comments which one of these activities you are going to take and use in your classroom right away next year. Which one do you think is most beneficial? Maybe you have one or two that you really want to focus on. Um, like I said, I did this webinar last year knowing how important vocabulary was and I still need to focus on it again next year. You know, we're always learning, always growing, and always trying to do better. I also wanted to let you know that every activity or little image of a product that I showed in this video all of those are included in my SJT Literacy Club. Now I have three different club memberships, the SJT Math Club, the SJT Literacy Club, and the SJT Writing Club. And they are teaching memberships that are basically an all-inclusive one-stop shop for you to log in, find out exactly the skill that you're teaching to your students, head there and print out whatever you need. And the SJT clubs are actually open for the summertime. They are open for you to join for the year. Let me give you a quick little sneak peek inside the club. When you log into the clubs, all of your clubs will show up here. Like I said, I have a writing club and a math club as well. But if you log into the literacy club, you can see that the folders on the side kind of help streamline everything you're looking for. So if you are looking for some phonological awareness and phonemic awareness activities, they are right here. Um, also, when you click these little arrows, you can see uh, everything underneath them. So if you're looking for a scope and sequence of phonemic awareness activities, they are here. You can see there are a bunch of activities for phoneme isolation, phoneme segmentation, phoneme manipulation, and rhyming. And then when we go into phonics, phonics is probably going to be the biggest one. Let me just close this up real quick. Um, if we go into phonics here, I actually split it into the different categories and skills that you will probably be teaching. So I do have up at the top just some uh, cards here. These are the blending cards that I mentioned in this video, the blending binder cards here. So you can grab these all at the top. Um, but if it's something specific, like let's pretend we're teaching blends and we'll go in here. Here are all the different activities we have for teaching blends. So here are the phoneme grapheme mapping mats that we have. Um, it's gonna, it might have a different picture, but this one is the blend specific one that you can download here. And you can just use the arrows to go right and left and see which different games we have. Decodable board games for blends. We have roll a word, which is a fun phonics game. And you can see over here on the left, we have bingo, say and spell, read the room. Uh, decodable sentence matches. We've got everything you need for students to be able to practice these skills. Uh, we also have um, syllable activities and a bunch of digital activities for Seesaw and Google. And then the other categories, of course, we have our comprehension. We have some monthly nonfiction passages as well as beginning comprehension passages, which are more decodable. We do have some themed vocabulary lessons here. Uh, and then we also have fluency activities as well. So this is a new favorite of mine called Roll, Say, and Cross Out, where students have to roll uh, a dice and then they have to say one of the words. And again, these are phonics skills based, so you can pick the ones that your students need. All of the book bunches that I mentioned, we have all the videos, they're all the um, 
stories right here. So if you were teaching creepy carrots, you can go ahead and download the whole unit for that here. Um, this is still being added to. There are a ton of other ones that are going to be added to this unit. We also have a bunch of bonuses. If you use the program Foundations, these slides go along with every single part of the lesson. Uh, it's something that I'm finishing up right now. Actually, six, seven, and eight are already done. So we are working on those other ones. Uh, we have book clubs, read and illustrate passages, lots of bonuses that go here as well, and a big video vault where these are just links to my YouTube videos if there's something that you want to learn a little bit more about. But this is all included inside the Literacy Club. I hope you can see just how much of a labor of love that club really has been over the last few years and how much it continues to grow. Every time I am coming up with new ideas for my own classroom, uh, I am making them and putting them right in the club because I know that if I need it as a first grade teacher, I'm sure there's another K through two teacher that also needs it. So I throw it in there right away for you to use. If you have any questions about anything in this video or anything about the SJT Literacy Club, please drop them down in the comments and I will do my best to make sure I answer it in a timely manner. As always, I do hope you appreciated this video. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up so I know. Make sure you are subscribed to my channel and click that bell. That way you're notified of every new video. See you in the next one. Bye.